You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Chapter 37 A happy inspiration prompts Tanchun to found the Crab Flower Club. And an ingenious arrangement enables Bao Chai to settle the chrysanthemum poem titles. This year Jia Jing was appointed commissioner for education in one of the provinces, with instructions to leave for his tour of duty on the 20th of the 8th month. When the day for his departure arrived, he took leave of his ancestors in the family shrine, kowtowed to his mother, and was seen on his way as far as the hostelry of the tearful parting, the first post halt on his journey, by Bao Yu and other junior male members of the clan. Jia Zhang's doings after his departure are not recorded in this history, we merely observe that the departure left Bao Yu free to play and idle in the garden to his heart's content, without the least fear of restraint or reprisal. The days in idleness passed by. To swell the tale of wasted years. On the day of which we write Bao Yu was feeling very bored. He had returned from perfunctory morning calls on his mother and grandmother, and had just finished changing back into his everyday clothes, when Tan Chun's maid Ebony arrived carrying a carefully folded letter from her mistress. I'm glad you've come, said Bao Yu, as she handed him the letter. I'd been meaning to see your mistress this morning, but I forgot. How is she? Is she any better? She's quite better, thank you, said Ebony. She stopped taking her medicine today. It was only a slight chill that she was suffering from. Bao Yu unfolded the elegant patterned notepaper and glanced at the contents. Dear brother, Some nights ago, when the moon came out in a sky freshly clear after the rain, the garden seemed veritably awash with moonlight, and sleep in the face of so rare a spectacle was unthinkable. Thrice the clepsydra had been turned, and still I lingered beneath the tall polonias, reluctant to go in. But in the end the treacherous night air betrayed me, and by morning I was lamentably indisposed. How kind of you to have visited me in my sickroom! And how exquisitely thoughtful to have sent your maidservant shortly afterwards with solicitous inquiries, and with those delicious lychees, and the calligraphy by Yen Junqing. While I have been lying here quietly on my own, I have been thinking how in the olden days even men whose lives were spent amidst the hurly-burly of public affairs would keep some quiet retreat for themselves with its tiny corner of mountain and trickle of running water, and how they would seek, by whatever arts and blandishments they knew of, to assemble there a little group of kindred spirits to share in their enjoyment of it, and how, on the basis of such leisure time associations, rhymers, guilds and poetry clubs were then founded, so that the fleeting inspirations of an idle hour might often be perpetuated in imperishable masterpieces of verse. Now although I am no poet myself, I am privileged to live midst rocks and streams, and in the company of such gifted practitioners of the poetic art as Shui and Lin, and it seems to me a great pity that the romantic courts and pavilions of our garden should not echo with the jocund carousal of assembled bards, and its flowering groves and blossoming banksides not become places of wine and song. Why should the founding of poetry clubs be the sole prerogative of the whiskered male, and female versificators allowed a voice in the tunable concert of the muses only when some enlightened patriarch sees fit to invite them? Will you come, then, and rhyme with us? The pathway to my door is swept to receive you and your arrival is eagerly awaited by Your affectionate sister Tan Chun When Bao Yu had finished reading, he clapped his hands delightedly. Dear Tan Chun Bless her poetic soul. I must go and discuss this with her straight away. He strode off immediately, with Ebony following at his heels. But he had got no further than Drenched Blossom's pavilion, when he saw one of the old nannies on duty at the back gate of the garden hurrying from the opposite direction with a note in her hand. She came up to him when she saw who he was and handed him the note. From Mr. Yun, sir. He's waiting at the back gate. He sends his compliments and says would I please give you this. Bao Yu opened it and read. Dear Father. I have the honor to present my humble duty, and hope this finds you as it leaves me in the best of health, ever since you did me the great kindness to recognize me as your son I have been looking for some means of showing my appreciation of your great kindness, but so far no opportunity has presented itself, to date. However, 
Thanks to your esteemed advice I have got to know several nurserymen also a number of famous gardens, and now through this contacts I have come across a very rare variety of autumn crab flower, pure white, only very little to be had, but using every means possible I have got two pots of it I hope you will think of me as a real son, and not refuse to keep them for your enjoyment. However, owing to the present hot weather I did not like to call in person as the young ladies are outside in the garden a lot owing to the heat, and not wishing to give inconvenience. I remain. Honored Father. Your dutiful and aft. Son. Jia Yun. Bao Yu laughed when he had finished reading it. Is he alone, he asked the old woman, or is there someone with him? He's got a couple of young chaps with him carrying potted plants. I see. Well go back and thank him for me. Tell him it's very kind of him, and I very much appreciate it. And have the pots taken to my room. When he had given these instructions, he continued with Ebony on his way to Autumn Studio. He arrived to find that Bao Chai, Dai Yu, Ying Chun and Shi Chun had all got there before him. They laughed excitedly when they saw him enter. Here comes another one. I hadn't realized that I was so popular, said Tan Chun. I wrote to you all more or less on the spur of the moment. It was no more than a tentative suggestion. I had no idea it would meet with this instant response from everybody. It's a pity you didn't think of it earlier, said Bao Yu. We ought to have started a club long ago. Well I don't think it's a pity, said Dai Yu. Do, by all means, have a poetry club if you're all so keen to, only count me out of it, please. I don't feel up to it. Ying Chun laughed. If you're not, then what about the rest of us? This is no time for false modesty, said Bao Yu. Here is a serious proposition and one which we are obviously all enthusiastic about. What we need are some ideas that we can all discuss. Come on, Chai. Let's hear what you have got to say first, then perhaps we can hear from Cousin Linear. What's the hurry, said Bao Chai. We're not even all here yet. Just as she was saying that, Li Wan arrived. She smiled at them all as she entered. My. What a poetic lot we are. If you are going to have a poetry club, may I propose myself for president? The idea of having one did in fact occur to me earlier in the year, but I thought that as I can't write poetry myself, a proposal coming from me might seem a bit presumptuous, and I did nothing about it. Now that my poetical sister-in-law has had the same idea, I should like to do what I can to help her get it started. If we are definitely going to have a poetry club, said Dai Yu, then as members of the club we are all equals and fellow poets. We can't go on calling ourselves cousin and sister-in-law all the time. I quite agree, said Li Wan. We ought to choose pen names to sign our poems with, then we can use them for addressing each other by as well. I shall call myself Farmer Sweet Rice. I don't suppose anyone else will want that title. I shall call myself Autumn Studio, said Tan Chun. That's pretty unoriginal, said Bao Yu. Can't you do any better than that? You've got all those polonias and plantain trees around your place, can't you make a name out of them? All right, said Tan Chun. I'm very fond of my plantains. I shall call myself under the plantains dot. That's very original, said the others admiringly. But Dai Yu laughed. Come on, everybody, she said. Pop her in the stew pot. We'll have a nice piece of venison with our wine. As no one could understand this recondite joke, Dai Yu undertook to explain it for them. Under the plantains is where the woodcutter in the old Taoist parable hid the deer he had killed, so the allusion means a deer. In calling herself by that pen name, Cousin Tan is therefore offering herself to her fellow members as venison for them to feast on in their carousals. Oh all right, Miss Clever, said Tan Chun. Plantain lover, then. You wait. I'll be even with you yet. I've got just the name for her, she told the others. When the Emperor Shun died, his two queens are supposed to have gone along the banks of the river Xiang looking for him. According to the legend, the two queens turned into river goddesses, 
and their tears became the spots you find on the bamboos that grow along the banks of the river. That's why there's a kind of bamboo called Nayad's tears. Well now, Cousin Di lives in the Nayad's house, and she cries so much that I shouldn't be at all surprised if one of these days the bamboos in her courtyard all turned out to have spots on them, so I think the best pen name for her would be River Queen Dot. The others, applauding, agreed that this was exactly the right name for Dai Yu. Dai Yu herself hung her head and said nothing. I've thought of one for Bao Chai, said Li Wan. Not regal, like Dai Yu's, but aristocratic, at any rate. What do you all think of Lady Allspice? I think the title becomes her very well, said Tan Chun. What about me, said Bao Yu. Isn't anyone going to think of a name for me? Oh, you, said Bao Chai. The obvious one for you is busybody, because you are always so busy doing nothing. Why not stick to your old pen name, Lord of the Flowers, said Li Wan. Do you have to embarrass me by reminding me of my youthful indiscretions, said Bao Yu. No, let me choose your name, said Bao Chai. Actually I've already thought of one. It sounds a bit common, perhaps, but I think it suits you. You are a very lucky person, living in such luxurious and beautiful surroundings, and you enjoy an exceptional amount of leisure, in fact, I can't think of anyone who combines quite so much luck with quite so much leisure, so I suggest Lucky Lounger as the most suitable pen name for you. Bao Yu laughed good-humoredly. You are flattering me. I think you'd better all call me by whatever name each of you fancies. No, that won't do, said Dai Yu. As you live in the House of Green Delights, why don't we simply call you Green Boy? Yes, said the others. Good. Now, what names are we going to have for cousining and cousin she, said Li Wan. Neither of us is much good at poetry, said Ing Chun. There doesn't seem much point in having any. No, I think you ought to have pen names, said Tan Chun. As Ing Chun lives on Amaryllis Ayat, she could be Amaryllis Islander, and as Shi Chen lives by the Lotus Pavilion, she could be Lotus Dweller, said Bao Chai. That would seem to be the simplest solution. Yes, said Li Wan. Those names will do very nicely. Now I'm the eldest here, so I'm going to propose some conditions that I'd like you all to agree to. I don't think you'll have much difficulty in doing so when you've heard what they are. The first one is that as three out of the seven of us founding this club, that's to say Cousin Ng, Cousin Xi and myself, are no good at writing poetry, I propose that the rest of you should let us off versifying and allow us to act as your officers instead. Cousin Ng? Cousin Xi, said Tan Chun. What's the good of inventing all these new names if you're not going to use them? I think that from now on there ought to be a penalty for not using them. First things first, said Li Wan. Let's get the club properly founded and we can talk about penalties later on. I suggest that the club should hold its meetings at my place, because I've got the most room. I can't write poetry myself, but if you don't object to having so illiterate a person as your host, I'm sure that as time goes by I shall grow more poetical and refined under your influence. My next condition is that you should make me your president. And as I shan't be able to manage all the official business on my own, I should like to be allowed to co-opt two vice presidents. I therefore nominate Amaryllis Islander and Lotus Dweller as my assistants, one to set the themes and rhymes in our competitions, and the other to act as invigilator and copyist. And lastly, although we three officers don't have to do any versifying, we should not be precluded from trying our hand at it if we want to. So if there is ever a fairly simple subject with easy rhymes, and we feel like joining in, we should be allowed to do so. The rest of you, of course, have no option. Well, those are my conditions. If you agree to them, I'll be glad to help you found the club. If not, I don't think there would really be much point in my tagging along. The proposed arrangement was highly agreeable to Ing Chun and Shi Chun, neither of whom had much enthusiasm for writing poetry, least of all in competition with experts like Bao Chai and Dai Yu, and they assented readily. The rest, when they saw how willingly Ing Chun and Shi Chun acquiesced, felt that they could scarcely object themselves and added their assent, though Tan Chun did remark, 
somewhat ruefully, that it seemed a little hard, when she was the one who had thought of the idea in the first place, that she should now have these other three sitting in judgment over her. Right, said Bao Yu. That's all settled. Let's all move over to Sweet Rice Village, then. You're always in such a hurry, said Li Wan. Today's meeting is just a preliminary discussion. Now you will have to wait for me to issue an invitation. Before we do anything else, said Bao Chai, we had better decide how often we are going to meet. Not too often, I hope, said Tan Chun, otherwise it will no longer be a pleasure. I suggest not more than two or three times a month. Twice a month will be quite enough, said Bao Chai. Once we've decided which two days to meet on, we should undertake always to turn up on those two days, wet or fine. At the same time, we should be allowed to arrange additional meetings outside the fixed dates, as, and when the fancy takes any of us to do so. If we leave it that much flexible, it will be more enjoyable. The others agreed that this was a good proposal, and should be adopted. The poetry club was originally my idea, said Tan Chun. I hope you will at least allow me the pleasure of being your hostess at its first meeting. All right, said Li Wan. We'll have a meeting tomorrow, and you shall entertain us. Why wait until tomorrow, said Tan Chun. There's no time like the present. You choose a title for us, Amaryllis Islander can set the rhymes, and Lotus Dweller can supervise us while we compose our poems. If you ask me, said Ing Chun, I think that rather than always have the same two people to choose the titles, and set the rhymes, it would be better to draw lots. As I was on my way here just now, said Li Wan, I saw them carrying in two pots of white crab blossom. It was so pretty. Couldn't you have white crab blossom for your subject? We haven't all seen it yet, said Ing Chun. How are they going to write poems about it if they haven't seen it? We all know what white crab blossom looks like, said Bao Chai. I don't see why we necessarily have to look at it in order to be able to write a poem about it. The ancients used a poetic theme as a vehicle for whatever feelings they happened to want to express at that particular moment. If they'd waited until they'd seen the objects they were supposed to be writing about, the poems would never have got written. Very well, then, I'll set your rhymes, said Ing Chun. She took a book of verse off the shelf, opened it at random, and held it up for the others to see. There you are, an octet in regulated verse. That's the form. She closed the book again and turned to a little maid who was leaning in the doorway looking on. Give us a word, she said. Any word. Door, said the girl. That means the first line must end with door, said Ing Chun. She turned again to the girl, another one. Pot, said the girl. Right, pot, said Ing Chun, and going over to a little nest of drawers in which rhyme cards were kept, she pulled out one of them and asked the maid to select two cards from it at random. These turned out to be the cards for knot and spot. Now, she said to the girl, pick any card out of any drawer. Just one. The girl pulled out another drawer and picked out the card for day. All right, said Ing Chun. That means that your first line must end in door, your second in pot, your fourth in knot, your sixth in spot, and the rhyming couplet in the seventh and eighth lines must end in day dot. Tan Chun's maid scribe laid out four identical sets of brushes and paper for the competitors, who all, except Dai Yu, now began, with quiet concentration, to consider what they were going to write. Dai Yu wandered around outside, playing with the bark of the polonia trees, admiring the signs of autumn in the garden, occasionally joking with the maids, and in general not giving the slightest indication that she was engaged in the throes of composition. Ying Chun told one of the maids to light a stick of sweet dreams, a kind of incense, which is only about three inches long, and has a very thick wick so that it burns down fairly rapidly, and told the competitors that they had to complete their poems by the time the incense had burned itself out, otherwise they would be penalized. Tan Chun soon had a poem ready. Taking up a brush, she wrote it out and, after going over it and making a few corrections, handed it into Ing Chun. Then she turned to Bao Chai. How are you doing, Lady Allspice? 
Have you thought of a poem yet? Well, yes, I've thought of something, said Bao Chai, but I'm not very happy about it. Bao Yu, meanwhile, was pacing up and down, hands clasped behind his back, in the loggia outside. Hearing this exchange, he paused to address Dai Yu. Do you hear that, he said. The other two have nearly finished. Kindly mind your own business, would you, said Dai Yu. Bao Yu glanced inside and saw that Bao Chai was busy writing her poem down. Lord, he said. There's only an inch left. He turned to Dai Yu again, the incense has nearly burned out. What are you still squatting over there on the damp grass for? Dai Yu ignored him. Oh well, said Bao Yu. I haven't got time to worry about you. I'll have to start writing my own now, whether it's any good or not. He went in then, and sat down at the table to write. I'm going to start reading the poems now, said Li Wan. Anyone who hasn't handed in by the time I've finished reading will have to pay a fine. Farmer Sweet Rice may not be much good at writing poetry, said Bao Yu, but she is jolly good at reading it. She's a very fair critic. I'm sure we shall all be willing to accept her judgment. The others nodded in agreement. Li Wan picked up Tan Chun's draft and the others crowded round to read it with her. A wintry sunset gilds the vine wreath door. Where stands, mossed by old rains, the flower pot. Its snowy blooms as snow impermanent. Are pure as pure white jade that alters not. O oh, fragrant frailty, that so fears the wind. Most radiant whiteness. Full moon without spot. White flower sprite, shake your silken wings. Away. And join with me to him the dying day too. All complimented Tan Chun on her poem when they had finished reading it. Then they looked at Bao Chai's. Guard the sweet scent behind closed courtyard door. And with prompt waterings do the mossy pot. The carmine hue their summer sisters wore. These snowy autumn blossoms envy not. For beauty in plain whiteness best appears. And only in white jade is found no spot. Chaste, lovely flowers. Silent, they seem to pray. To autumn's white god at the close of day. Li Wan smiled. That has the allspice touch all right. Next they looked at Bao Yu's poem. White autumn's sister stands beside the door. Like summer snow her blossoms fill the pot. A young fay rising naked from the bath. With a cool, chaste allure that she had not. The dawn wind could not dry those pearly tears. With which night's rain each flowerets I did spot. Pensive and grave, her blossoms gently sway. While a sad flute laments the dying day. 1. When they had finished reading, Bao Yu said he liked Tan Chun's poem best of the three, but Li Wan insisted that Bao Chai's was superior. It had more character, she said. She was about to press Dai Yu for her contribution, when Dai Yu sauntered in of her own volition. Oh. Have you all finished? She picked up a brush and proceeded, writing rapidly and without a pause, to set down the poem that was already completed in her mind. She wrote on the first sheet of paper that came to hand and, having finished, threw it nonchalantly across the table for the others to inspect. Beside the half-raised blind, the half-closed door. Crushed ice for earth and white jade for the pot. They had got no further than the first couplet, when Bao Yu broke out into praises. Clever. How do you get these ideas? Three parts of whiteness from the pear tree stolen. One part from plum for scent, which pear has not. All of them were impressed by this second couplet. This is good. Original. It's quite different from the other three. Moon maidens stitched them with white silken thread. And virgins' tears the new-made flowers did spot. Which now, like bashful maids that no word say. Lean languid on the breeze at close of day. Yes, this is the best, they said. This is the best of the four. For elegance and originality, yes, said Li Wan, but for character and depth I prefer Lady Allspice. I think that's a fair judgment, said Tan Chun. 
I think River Queens has to take second place. At all events, said Lee Wan, Green Boys is bottom. Do you accept that judgment, Green Boy? Oh yes, said Bao Yu. It's a perfectly fair one. Mine is just not a good poem. But, he smiled hopefully, I think we ought to reconsider the placing of Allspice and River Queen's contributions. You agreed to abide by my decisions, said Li Wan. I don't think the rest of you have any say in the matter. If anyone questions a decision of mine in future, he will have to pay a penalty. Bao Yu was obliged to let the matter drop. I propose that our two meetings should be on the 2nd and 16th of each month, said Li Wan. On those occasions I shall be responsible for choosing the subjects and the rhymes. If any of you ever feels like having an extra meeting in between those dates, there's nothing to stop you. In fact, there's nothing to stop you having a meeting every day, if you feel like it. But that's entirely up to you. On the 2nd and 16th you must all come round to my place, and the meetings on those two days are my responsibility. We really ought to have a name for the club, said Bao Yu. We don't want anything banal, said Tan Chun, on the other hand we don't want anything too weird and wonderful. As we started off with a poem about white crab blossom, why don't we simply call ourselves the Crab Flower Club? That might have seemed a somewhat banal title other things being equal, but in our case it wouldn't be because it would commemorate our founding meeting. Tan Chun's proposal was followed by general discussion. After partaking of the liquid and other refreshment which she provided, the party then broke up, some returning to their own apartments in the garden, some going on to Grandmother Jia's or Lady Wang's apartments outside. Our record leaves them at this point, and does not specify. Aroma had been present when Bao Yu received Tan Chun's letter, and had seen him rush off excitedly with Ebony as soon as he had finished reading it, but without having any idea what the cause of his excitement might be. Shortly after he left, Two of the old women from the back gate arrived carrying pots of white flowering autumn crab. Aroma asked them who the flowers were from, and when the old women had explained, showed them where she wanted them put, after which she took them into the servants' quarters and made them sit down while she went off to Bao Yu's room to fetch some money. She weighed out twelve penny weights of silver and made it into a little parcel, then, taking out an additional three hundred copper cash, hurried back to the old women. The silver is to pay the bearers with, she told them as she handed them the money. The cash is for you to buy yourselves a drink with. The old women stood up, beaming all over their faces. How kind, how very kind, they said, they couldn't possibly take it. But as Aroma insisted, they allowed themselves to be persuaded. Are there any boys on duty outside the gate? Aroma asked them. Oh yes, there are always four there, said the old women, to do any errands you young ladies in the garden happen to want done outside. If there's anything you want done, miss, just let us know, and we'll get them to do it for you. It isn't for me, said Aroma smiling. I wouldn't presume. It's Master Bao. He wants someone to go to the Marquis of Zhong Jing's place to deliver some things to Miss Sure. I thought that now you're here I might as well ask you if you wouldn't mind when you get back telling the boys on the gate to go out and order a cab for me. Only if they do, will you come to me for the fare, please? Don't go bothering them in the front about it. The old women departed, promising to do as she asked, while Aroma went back into the main apartment for a saucer to put some of the things on that she was planning to send to Xiangyun. But when she looked on the dresser she found that the saucer shelf was completely empty. She glanced back to where Skybright, Ripple and Musk sat sewing together. What happened to that white onyx saucer that used to be here, she asked them. The girls looked at each other blankly, trying to remember. After some moments, Skybright's face broke into a smile. I remember. I took it to Miss Tan's with those leeches on. It's still there. Whatever did you take that one for, when there are so many other things you could have used? Well, yes, that's what I said. But the dark brown lychees and the white and brownie onyx did go very well together. Even Miss Tan said how pretty they looked. She made me leave the dish there, where she could look at it. That's why I didn't bring it back with me. 
By the way, that pair of identical vases that used to be on the very top of the dresser isn't back yet, either. You'll laugh if I tell you about them, said Ripple. You know how Master Bao never does anything by halves. Well, the other day he had a sudden rush of dutiful feelings come over him. He just picked a couple of sprays of kasha and was going to put them in a vase, when suddenly he said, Oh. These are the first kasha flowers I've picked this year. I mustn't keep them for my own enjoyment. So what does he do but fetch down those two vases, put the water in them, and arrange the flowers in them himself, and go along with them, someone else carrying them, of course, to her old ladyship and her ladyship to give them each a vase. Anyway, the beauty of it was that some of the effects of this rubbed off on the person carrying the vases, which it so happens was me. When her old ladyship saw the flowers, she was so delighted you just can't imagine. Oh look, she said. What a good boy he is to me. He can't even see a flower without thinking of his old granny. And people grumble at me for being too fond of him. Well, as I expect you know, her old ladyship normally doesn't seem to have much use for me. I don't know what it is, but there's something about me she doesn't seem to like, but on this occasion she gave me a hundred cash. And she called me a poor little thing. Poor little thing, she said. She looks so sickly. I can tell you, I never expected a piece of luck like that. I mean, a hundred cash is nothing, but the honor. In front of all those people. Then when we got to her ladyships, her ladyship was with Mrs. Lien and Mrs. Zhao going through her chests, and looking out some of the things she used to wear when she was a girl to give to someone, I don't know who it was. Anyway, when she saw us, she left off to admire the flowers. So of course Mrs. Lien has to make the most of it by putting in her pennyworth, going on about how dutiful Master Bao is, and how thoughtful, and how this that and the other, I can't remember a half of what she said, there was a whole cartload of it, but whatever it was it gave her ladyship a lot of face, hearing him praised like that in front of everybody, and you know who not being able to say a word against him, so of course she was very pleased. And what do you think? She gave me two dresses. Pooh, said Skybright. Silly girl. You don't know much. Those would be two dresses that she thought weren't good enough to give to the other person. I can't see much honor in that. I don't care, said Ripple. It was still very kind of her ladyship, for all that. If it had been me, I shouldn't have wanted them, said Skybright. What? Take someone else's old leftovers? All of us here are only maids, none of us is supposed to be any higher than the rest, you know. Why should she give someone else the best and give me the leftovers? No, I'm sorry. I should have had to refuse, even if it meant offending her. I couldn't take a thing like that lying down. Which of us was it that she gave those other dresses to, said Ripple, curious. I've been home all these last few days. I must have been away when it happened. Be a sport, Skye, tell us who it was. Why, if I tell you, will you give those two dresses back again? Of course not, silly. I'd just like to know, said Ripple. Don't care if it was Master Bao's little puppy dog she gave them to, I still think her ladyship meant to do me a kindness, and as far as I'm concerned, that's all that matters. The other maids laughed. You'd better watch what you say. That's just who she did give them to, Master Bao's little dog, Flower. Wicked girls, said Flower's aroma, laughing in spite of herself, taking my name in vain. Whenever you've got a few moments to spare you are making fun of me. There's not one of you that will come to a good end. Oh, it was you, said Ripple. I'm so sorry, I didn't realize. Oh, I do apologize. All right, that's enough fooling for now, said Aroma. The question is, which of you is going to get that saucer? Better get the vases back too, while we're about it, said Musk. The one in her old ladyship's room should be safe enough, but I wouldn't be too sure about the one at her ladyship's. There are so many people in and out of that place, especially you know who and her lot. If they see anything from our room in there, they're sure to find some way of breaking it accidentally on purpose if they get half a chance. Her ladyship won't stop them. She never notices. 
We ought to get that one back, at least, as soon as we can. You're right, said Skybright, laying down her sewing. I'll go and get it now. No, I'll go for that, said Ripple. You go and get your saucer. I'm going for the vase, said Skybright. Why should you have all the windfalls? You others have all had a go. Now it's my turn. You do exaggerate, said Musk. It's only Ripple who's had the luck. And it was only because of the coincidence that her ladyship happened to be going through her dresses when she arrived. Do you suppose she'll be going through them again if you go there now? Maybe not, said Skybright, with a tinge of malice. On the other hand, maybe she'll notice how conscientious I am, and pay me two tails a month out of her allowance. You see, she paused to add this on her way out of the room, I know what goes on in here. There's no need for the play acting. She ran off with a mocking laugh. Ripple went, too, and fetched the onyx saucer from Tan Chun's room, after which Aroma made ready the things that were to go to Xiang Yun, and called an old mama song, one of the nannies attached to Green Delights, to give her instructions for their delivery. Get yourself smartened up and change into your best things, she said. I want you to go out presently and take some things for me to Miss Shur's. You can give them to me now, Miss, and any message that you want me to deliver, said Mama Song, then I can go off straight away, as soon as I've got myself ready. Aroma fetched two little boxes of lacquer and bamboo basketwork, and taking the tops off them, put fox nuts and caltrips in one and a saucerful of chestnut fudge, made of chestnut puree steam cooked with cashew flavored sugar, in the other. These are all our own things or made from our own things freshly gathered in the garden that Master Bao is sending Miss Sure a taste of, she said. Tell her the onyx saucer the fudge is on is the one she was admiring last time she was here, and she is to keep it. This silk bag has got the sewing in that she asked me to do for her. Tell her the needlework's a bit on the rough side, but I'm sure she'll understand. And say Master Bao sends his regards. And of course I present my compliments. I think that's all. Isn't there any message from Master Bao, said Mama Song. Perhaps you'd better ask him, Miss, just in case. We don't want him saying afterwards that we've forgotten something. Didn't he go round just now to Miss Tan's place? Aroma asked Ripple. Yes, said Ripple. They're all round there. They were having a discussion about setting up a poetry club, whatever that might be and they were writing poems, some of them. She turned to Mama Song. I shouldn't think he'd have anything to say. I should just push on, if I were you. Mama Song took up the boxes, and went off to get herself ready. When you are ready, go out by the back gate, said Aroma as she was leaving. You'll find some of the boys there and a cab waiting for you. Mama Song then left. The details of her expedition are unrecorded. Some time after this Baoyu got back. The first thing he did on arrival was to go and look at the autumn crab flowers. When he had finished admiring them, he went into the house and told Aroma all about the poetry club, after which Aroma told him how she had sent Mama Song to Shursiangyun's with a present of things from the garden. Baoyu smote his palms together in vexation. Oh, we forgot about her. I knew there was something we ought to have done and hadn't, but I couldn't think what it was. I'm glad you've reminded me. We must invite her over at once, of course. The poetry club will be nothing without her in it. I don't think I'd be in such a hurry to, if I were you, said Aroma. It's only an amusement, this poetry thing, and Miss Sure doesn't have the time for amusement that the rest of you do. It isn't as if she were her own mistress, you know. Even if you tell her about this, and she wants to come, it doesn't follow that they'll let her. Suppose they don't. She'll only fret about it, and then all you'll have done will be to have made her feel miserable for nothing. That's no problem, said Bao Yu. I shall ask her old ladyship to have her fetched. Just then Mama Song got back, mission completed, bearing Xiang Yun's thanks to Aroma for the things. She asked me what Master Bao was doing said the nanny, so I told her that he and the young ladies were starting a poetry club or some such. She was very upset. 
Oh, she said, are they writing poetry? I wish they'd have told me about it. Bao Yu waited to hear no more. Dashing round to his grandmother's, he insisted that she should send instantly to have Xiang Yun fetched. It's too late now, said grandmother Jia. We'll send for her first thing tomorrow. Bao Yu had to be content with that, and went back to his room much downcast. He was round at grandmother Jia's first thing next morning again, pestering, but it was not until the early afternoon that Xiang Yun eventually arrived and his equanimity was restored. As soon as they were all together, Bao Yu began to tell Xiang Yun how the club had come to be founded, and what they had done at its first meeting. He was about to show her the poems that they had written, but Li Wan prevented him. Don't let her see them yet, she said. Just tell her the rhymes. As she missed our first meeting, her penalty shall be to make up another poem now, using the same rhymes that we did. If it's all right, we shall invite her to join the club straight away. If not, she must first entertain us all at our next meeting as a further penalty. I like that, said Xiang Yun, laughing. You should be the ones to pay a penalty, for having forgotten to invite me. Well, show me the rhymes, then. I'm not much good at this sort of thing, but I don't mind making a fool of myself. As long as you'll let me join your club, I don't mind what I have to do, sweep the floor and light the incense for you, if you like. Delighted to see her so enthusiastic, and still reproaching themselves for having forgotten about her at their inaugural meeting, the rest of them made haste to give her the rhyme words so that she could begin. Xiang Yun was much too excited for careful composition. Having, even while they were all talking, concocted a number of verses in her head, she took up a brush and proceeded to write them down, without a single pause for correction, on the first piece of paper that came to hand. There you are, she said, handing it to the others. I've written two poems using the rhymes you gave me. I don't know whether they're any good or not, but at least I have done what I was told. We thought our four had just about scraped the barrel, they told her. We couldn't have written one more poem on the subject, let alone two. Whatever can you have found to say in them? I bet they just repeat what we said in ours. But when they looked at the poems, this is what they read. 1. Of late a goddess came down to my door and planted seeds of white jade in a pot from which a wondrous white frost maiden grew who, loving cold, all other things loves not. Last night a cloud passed by, whose autumn shower her cold, unweeping eyes with tears did spot. Since when, the poet here takes up his stay to praise her loveliness by night and day. 2. Where flower-fringed steps approach the ivied door. At the wall's foot or in a graceful pot. What flowers do more sad autumn thoughts inspire? Than these, whose pureness others rival not. Wax tears their petals seem, by wind congealed. Or filtered moonlight, flecked with many a spot. Weep they because the shadows stole away. Their goddess queen, who now makes dark night day. The reading of these poems was punctuated at the end of each line with expressions of admiration and surprise, and when they had got to the end, all of them agreed that these two poems had made the exercise a worthwhile one and fully justified their naming the new society the Crabflower Club. You must let me provide the refreshments tomorrow as my penalty, said Xiang Yun. I hope you will all consent to be my guests. Splendid, they said and proceeded to show her the poems they had written the day before, and to discuss them with her. That evening Bao Chai, who had invited Xiang Yun to spend the night with her at Allspice Court, sat with her guest under the lamplight, while the latter discussed themes for the morrow's meeting and plans for the projected entertainment. As it became increasingly apparent that her ideas on the subject were quite impracticable, Bao Chai presently interrupted the flow. The club has only just been founded, and this will be its first entertainment, she said. Although it's all only a game, you are setting a precedent, so you need to think about it rather carefully. If the entertainment is to be equally enjoyable for everyone, you don't want it to be too much of a burden on you, but on the other hand you don't want the others to feel that they are being given short commons. Now, you are not your own mistress, and the few strings of cash they give you a month at home are not even enough for your own needs. 
And if your aunt got to hear that you were spending money on a frivolous thing like this, she would have still more to grumble about than usual. In any case, even if you spent all you've got, it still wouldn't be enough to provide an entertainment for several people. So what are you going to do? You obviously can't send home for money. Are you going to ask them here for some? Sion Yun, brought back to the realities of her situation, was very much dashed. While she hesitated, Bao Chai went on. Actually I've thought of a way out of this. An assistant in one of our pawn shops comes from a place where they have very good crabs. Now nearly everyone here from Lady Jia and Aunt Wang downwards is fond of crabs, and only the other day, Aunt Wang was saying that we ought to have a crab and cash viewing party for Lady Jia. It's only because she has been otherwise occupied that she hasn't done anything about it. Why not issue a general invitation, making no mention of the poetry club, we can write all the poems we want to after the rest of them have gone, and I shall ask my brother to let us have a few baskets of the biggest, fattest-looking crabs and tell him to get us a few jars of good wine and side dishes for four or five tables from the shop. That should save a lot of trouble for you and make more of an occasion of it for everybody else. Xiang Yun felt deeply grateful to Bao Chai and praised her warmly for her thoughtfulness. Bao Chai smiled deprecatingly. Now you mustn't go imagining things and feel that you are being treated like a poor relation. It's only because I am so fond of you that I have ventured to make this proposal. If you promise you won't take it amiss, I can get them to arrange it for us straight away. My dearest girl, said Xiang Yun. Of course I shan't take it amiss. How can you suggest such a thing? If you do so again, I shall begin to think that you aren't really fond of me at all. I may be a silly goose, but there are some things I understand. Do you think that if I didn't look on you as my own true sister, I should ever have told you last time I was here about all those tiresome things I have to put up with at home? Reassured, Bao Chai called in an old woman to take a message outside to her brother. Tell Mr. Pan to get us a few baskets of crabs like the ones we had the other day. It's for after lunch tomorrow. We're having a cash viewing party in the garden for their ladyships. Tell him please not to forget, because I've already invited all the guests. The old woman went off to deliver her message. In due course she reported back again, but these are details omitted from our story. Bao Chai resumed her conversation with Xiang Yun. About the theme for tomorrow's poems, she said. We don't want anything too outlandish. If you look at the works of the great poets, you find that they didn't go in for the weird and wonderful titles and daring rhymes that people nowadays are so fond of. Outlandish themes and daring rhymes do not produce good poetry. They merely show up the poverty of the writer's ideas. Certainly one wants to avoid clichés, but one can easily go too far in the pursuit of novelty. The important thing is to have fresh ideas. If one has fresh ideas, one does not need to worry about clichés, the words take care of themselves. But what am I saying all this for? Spinning and sewing is the proper occupation for girls like us. Any time we have left over from that should be spent in reading a few pages of some improving book, not on this sort of thing. Yes, said Xiang Yun, without much conviction but presently smiled as a new idea occurred to her. I've just thought of something. Yesterday's theme was white crab blossom. The flower I'd like to write about is the chrysanthemum. Couldn't we have chrysanthemums as our theme for tomorrow? It is certainly a very seasonable one, said Bao Chai. The trouble is that so many people have written about it before. Yes, said Xiang Yun, I suppose it is rather a hackneyed one. Bao Chai thought for a bit. Unless of course you somehow involve the poet in the theme, she said. You could do that by making up verb object or concrete abstract titles, in which chrysanthemums was the concrete noun or the object of the verb as the case might be. Then your poem would be both a celebration of chrysanthemums and at the same time a description of some action or situation. Such a treatment of the subject has been tried in the past, but it is a much less hackneyed one. The combining of narrative and lyrical elements in a single treatment makes for freshness and greater freedom. It sounds a splendid idea, said Xiang Yun. 
But what sort of verbs or abstract nouns had you in mind? Can you give me an example? Bao Chai thought for a bit. What about the dream of the chrysanthemums? Yes, that's a good one, said Xiang Yun. I've thought of one too. Couldn't we have the shadow of the chrysanthemums? Yi yes, said Bao Chai, doubtfully. The trouble is, it's been used before. Still, if we had a lot of titles we could probably slip it in. I've thought of another. Well, come on then, said Xiang Yun. What about questioning the chrysanthemums? Xiang Yun slapped the table appreciatively. That's a lovely one. Presently she added, I've thought of another. What do you think of seeking the chrysanthemums? That should be interesting, said Bao Chai. Let's start making a list. We'll write down up to ten titles, and then see what we think of them. The two of them busied themselves for some minutes grinding ink and softening a brush. Xiang Yun then proceeded to write down the titles at Bao Chai's dictation. Soon they had ten. Xiang Yun read them over. Ten doesn't make a set, she said. We need two more to make a round dozen, then we shall have just the right number for a little album. Bao Chai supplied two more without too much difficulty. If we're thinking in terms of a sequence of poems, she said, we may as well, while we're about it, arrange these titles in some sort of order. That's it, said Xiang Yun. Then they will be all ready for making our chrysanthemum album with afterwards. Remembering the chrysanthemums should come first, said Bao Chai. Now, let's see. When you remember them, you realize you haven't got any, so you go and look for some. So seeking the chrysanthemums will be the second title. Well, having found some, you will want to plant them, so planting the chrysanthemums will be the third title. After you've planted them and the flowers have come out, you'll want to stand and look at them, so the fourth title will be admiring the chrysanthemums. You won't be able to have enough of them by just standing and admiring them, so you'll naturally want to pick some and arrange them in a vase so that you can enjoy them indoors. That means arranging the chrysanthemums for number five. But however much you enjoy them, you will feel that they somehow lack their full luster without words to grace them, and so you will want to celebrate them in verse. That means celebrating the chrysanthemums will be the sixth title. Well now, let's suppose you've just finished writing some verses about them. You've got the ink ready made and the brush is still in your hand, and you feel like paying the chrysanthemums a further tribute. What should you do but paint them? That's number seven, painting the chrysanthemums. Now in spite of these silent tributes, you still don't know the secret of the chrysanthemums' mysterious charm, and you can't resist asking them. Which brings us to number eight, questioning the chrysanthemums. And if the chrysanthemums could really reply, it would be so delightful that you would want to have them near you all the time, and how better than by wearing the chrysanthemums. That's number nine. That brings us to the end of the verb object titles, which involve the poet himself as the understood subject of the action. But there remain other kinds of treatment, in which we consider the flowers by themselves without postulating the presence of the poet. So we have the shadow of the chrysanthemums and the dream of the chrysanthemums as numbers 10 and 11. And of course the death of the chrysanthemums at the end of the album to round off on a suitable note of melancholy. There you are. All three months of autumn condensed into a single sequence of a dozen poems. Xiang Yun recopied the twelve titles in the order that Bao Chai had indicated, then, after running her eye rapidly over them, she asked Bao Chai what rhyme scheme they should set. I have always disliked set rhymes, said Bao Chai. If you have a good poem in the making, why shackle it with the constraints of an arbitrary rhyme scheme? Let us leave set rhymes to vulgar pedants. All we need do is give out the titles, and let the others choose their own rhyme schemes for themselves. After all, the object of the exercise is to give people enjoyment, the enjoyment gained by producing an occasional felicitous line. We aren't out to make things difficult for them. I entirely agree, said Xiang Yun. And I am sure that in this way we shall get better poems. There's just one thing, though, we have twelve titles now but only five people writing poems. 
Presumably we aren't going to ask each of them to produce a poem for every one of the titles? Oh no, that would be much too difficult, said Bao Chai. Make a fair copy of the list of titles, merely indicating that the poems are to be octets in regulated verse, put it up on the wall where everyone can see it, and then simply let them choose whichever titles they like. If anyone has the energy to do them all, they are welcome to try. If they can't manage more than one, let them do just one. Skill and speed are what we shall be looking for. As soon as all of the twelve titles have been covered, we shall call a halt, and anyone who goes on writing after that will be made to pay a penalty. Xiang Yun did not see that this last stipulation was necessary, but otherwise agreed with her, and the two girls, having satisfied themselves that their plans for the morrow were now complete, put out the light and composed themselves for sleep. As to the outcome of their plans, that will be told in the following chapter. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you.